God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God spake these words and said, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have none other gods but me. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. A reading from Isaiah, chapter 43, beginning at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like the, qu the quick. Remember not the former things, nor the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beast will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I gave water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people for whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. The psalm this morning is Psalm 126. You'll read it responsibly by whole verse. I will begin. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those in a dream. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Those who sow in tears shall reap with silence of joy. A reading from Philippians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him 
and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may obtain resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And in everything, if you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and said, sent him away empty-handed. And he set yet a, sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. The Gospel of the Lord. May we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. There will be a new way for God's people to live, promised before the advent of Christ, hundreds of of years prior. The prophet Isaiah says this in chapter 43. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. There will be a new way for God's people to live and to know God and to worship God. Not yet, but that t time will come. But even in the Old Testament, we find that people rightly really related to God through their faith and trust in God. And that's what God was always looking for in his people, to know him by faith, by trust in him. But over the centuries, that had been obscured by a religious ruling elite that cared more about rightly relating to rules and regulations. And that's how you showed how much you cared about God or how religious you were and how good you were, rather than faith in God. And in the parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 20, Jesus tells those scribes and chief priests and all that were listening that the old order would be swept away. And Jesus says these words in the temple itself, shortly before he was crucified. That one day, the, the vineyard, which is representing the, God's people, Israel, that religious leadership would be swept away and replaced by those who want to follow God by trusting him and, and faith in Christ from the heart. And what Jesus says came true. What Jesus said came true. That one day, God would do a new thing. And it was achieved through Christ's death on the cross. That sins of humanity were atoned for. And through faith in Christ, all people everywhere have the opportunity for a new relationship with God. I'd like to focus on the passage from Philippians chapter 3. Because what it speaks of is the new life that was promised by the prophet, brought into effect by Jesus, and now made clear in the lives of a worshiping community in Philippi, but also for all worshiping communities, how to press on with God. What has Jesus done for us? And what does that mean in life with Christ? And to press on with Jesus means evaluating your past in light of what Christ has done for you. To press on with Jesus, and that's a major theme in this passage in chapter 3, means evaluating your past in light of what Jesus has done for you. This is Paul's attitude. Verse 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now, he's referring to his past that we don't cover in this passage, but if you look in the, your Bibles, it, just prior to this passage, Paul talks about his pedigree. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh or what has been achieved, humanly speaking, he says in chapter 3, verse 4, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Uh, th this guy went to prep school. He went to Harvard. Uh, you know, he had all his ducks in a row. He was uh, on a fast track for leadership of his community. He was doing all the right things. He was ticking all the boxes. And yet he says that he counts all that for loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And what Paul is talking about is this. He says his past life was determined by a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Well, it wasn't just his own. But it was his own. But what he's talking about was that that's what he'd been taught by the Pharisees, the religious elite. They determined how the, a person could attain the right relationship with God. This is what you do. You just, you just follow these steps. You follow these rules. And it seemed very proper because all these rules and regulations, and there were 613 in total, were derived from the moral law that we just recited. God's law is perfect, so why don't you take what's perfect and try to frame your entire life according to all of these rules and regulations. You keep all those, and God's going to be happy with you. That's what they thought. But what they forgot in the process of developing all these laws and saying, this is what you got to do, they didn't really have much time for simple trust in God or faith in God. In fact, that was replaced by having more faith in keeping these rules and regulations than just simple faith and trust in God. In fact, it became obscured by the Pharisees. That's why they were not fair, you see. Remember that from Sunday school as a kid? They were not fair, you see? <laughs> oh, yes. It is early, I know, I know. And, and there is coffee afterwards, so just to let you know. Paul and the religious elite had a righteousness of their own that came from the law. And Paul rejects this kind of righteousness because it bypasses an inescapable truth. It's an inescapable truth that they're trying to avoid. No one can be righteous enough to meet God's perfect standard. It can't happen. And Paul says elsewhere in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To think you can be righteous enough, as the Pharisees did and Paul did in his past life, is an illusion. It's a deception that Paul used to live by, but no longer. He's no longer deceived because he knows Christ by faith and what Christ has done for him. His standing before God no longer depends on his own righteousness or human righteousness or any kind of human idea that you can make yourself right with God by what you do. His righteousness now is actually Christ's righteousness. It's given to him. And theologians like to call this imputed because it's a cool sounding word. But it means essentially it's been given to him and given to us by Christ and received by faith in Christ. Because it's only Jesus that was able to live a perfect sinless life. And by faith in what Christ has done for us on the cross taking our sins, we get his righteousness. We gain his righteousness. It's his through faith in what Christ has done by the finished work on the cross. So Paul now has a, a righteousness that comes from Christ that depends on faith. And he goes on to say this, that because of what Christ has done, he wants to know him and the power of his resurrection and may, so that he may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the re resurrection from the dead. So here's the thing. To enjoy 
this life that's been given by faith and to understand what it means to, to have Christ's righteousness, it means being conformed to Christ's life, but also his death, that the way to life is death. And conformity to Christ's death is in view in this passage, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And this is what one scholar says about this passage. He says, the death and resurrection of Christ are representative acts in which his people share. Like, that's what we share. His death for sin and to sin carried the implication that in him we likewise die to the domination of the old nature and rise to newness of life. When Jesus died on the cross, our death was involved. But its outworking requires the exhortation of Romans 6.11, which says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Since we're dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, we face life with a new perspective. We don't have to face life with dread. We see suffering in its proper place. Jesus suffered. We suffered. It's what it means to be human. But he is with us as we live. And we're able to look forward to the day when this suffering ceases and we're with Christ in his near presence. And then one day we will have bodies like Christ's body, a resurrected body. So we have this tension, even though we know Christ and are saved, our final journey is not being completed. And it only will be reached when Christ returns. So final perfection cannot be expected in this life. And there's always room for growth as we are a here as a pilgrim people in the church. But there is something that we can take away as redeemed and sanctified people. That Christ is in us and with us. That we have his righteousness and not a righteousness of our own making. And this is something that enabled Paul to have a new perspective in how to live and how to press on by seeing his, his past in light of what Christ had, has done for him and what Christ has done for us. And it is because of, of Jesus and what he has done for Paul and all who place their faith in him that God has these encouraging words in verse 12. Of chapter 3. Not that I've already obtained this. Or am already perfect. But I press on. To make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers. I do not consider that I have made it on my own. But one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind. And straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God. In Christ Jesus. He says press on twice in this passage and it's the Greek word diazo or I'm sorry it's diako I, I'm sure you picked up on that it's diako and it's it's a, um, dioko is, is a word from athletics and it means um, to uh, it, it's the picture of a runner uh, who sees the finish line and is striving towards that finish line you see that in the Olympics right or in the Winter Olympics they, they'd see the the end, and they're, they're going, like, some of those ridiculous sports, like the bi biathlon, you know, they got a rifle on their back, and they got the skis on, well, they see the finish line, and, and they're going for it, right, and that's the idea of Dioko, striving towards that, that uh, end of the race, and the prospect of a prize, and in order to, to, to strive like that, to keep on going, 
You, you can't deviate. You, you, have to, you have to keep going without swerving off course. And it takes the utmost effort. A similar picture is given in Hebrews 12 where the author says, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. This is the idea of pressing on, keeping going with God. And Paul talks about the upward call of God in Christ Jesus and this prize. And when you think of a prize for, for finishing a race, like at the Olympics, you get a gold medal if you win, right? And if you win a, uh, it's like a golf tournament or any kind of athletic competition, you usually get a trophy. And if you're a pro, you get a lot of money, like a lot of money. You win some of these golf tournaments now, it's like two, three million dollars for first place. It's incredible. Just showing up, you get like a hundred thousand bucks. I mean, it's incredible that the sort of money, but that the, the prize money for the winner is it's unbelievable. But what's the prize here? There's no there's no monetary value attached to what Paul's talking about here. The the prize of this upward call of God is Jesus. He is the prize. He is the reason for striving. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he helps us strive. He is the, the one we're striving toward and the one we're striving with. It's a matter of being a person who is, is filled with this motivation that Christ has given us by giving us his new life. This is the change that has occurred in us through the new nature that Christ gave us as a gift, that our old nature has been crucified with Christ and that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, allowing me to forget the past and those sins that used to cling to me are gone. You may remember your past and the things you, you've done and just go, ugh, but they no longer have the power over you they once did because of what Christ has done for you. Those sins no longer condemn you and they have no power to condemn you and to judge you because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come because of Christ. That is gives us the ability to press on, Paul says. And let those, verse 15, who are mature, think this way, and if anything, if, if, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will re reveal that also to you, only let us hold true to what we have attained. What Paul's saying is that, you know, you may disagree on, on a few points here and there, as Christian people do. But consider what Paul says. Pray about it. Align your thinking to what God's word declares. And it will be revealed to you in due time. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In other words, the, the, the essentials, hold on to those things as, as you sort out some of the details of what pressing on really looks like in your life. So one way to look at pressing on is it's like a, a, a marathon. It, like life is a marathon with God. Okay, you, you, you come to faith in Christ. And you uh, go through your day and your months and the years. And uh, as you, you go on, uh, the, the idea is that you, you get a little closer to the goal of being with Jesus forever when we die. So along the way, we make a little progress here, make a little progress there. Uh, oh, stumble here, stumble there. Oh, it, now it's Lent. Now we got to consider our sins. We think about our sins and how we live now, and we try to do better, okay? Now, nothing is essentially wrong with that way of, of thinking because we're not perfect, but we're making progress. We may be not uh, pressing on. We're kind of plodding on one step in front of the other and kind of stumbling here and there. 
And that's one way of looking at pressing on. But, but here's another one, I think a more helpful picture of pressing on. And it's a picture that comes from Martin Luther. And, and we, we don't look at our life so much, the totality of our life with Christ and, and progressing toward a goal and the prize. We, we look at pressing on as a daily activity. And we press on with Christ every day by faith, starting the morning, saying the Lord's Prayer, Scripture reading. What, what Luther did, he, read, he uh, recited the Lord's Prayer, uh, the, he did the ten, recited the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed every single day. And you think, well, you know, but, I mean, the guy was a spiritual giant. Why would he do that? Because he said, r- really, you, you need to start at square one all the time with God it, because it's not like learning a language or learning a subject that you actually do progress you don't progress in that way, Luther said. You don't, you don't become more and more holy that way. But, but what you do is by repeating things time in, day in, day out. This, this pattern of prayer, what it does, it builds up your confidence and your hope by faith in God. It's like learning a song. Is it one and done with a song? You hear it once, and now some of the musicians here, you know, yes, they hear it and they get it, right? But, but mere mortals, it takes us a long time to learn a song, and you learn a song by repetition, going through it again and again and again. And what happens to that song? It gets into our heart. We learn, this, and this is our phrase, we learn the song by heart, right? We learn it by heart. It gets into our heart. That's why we have repetition in the church. You may have noticed that the service, the liturgy, is pretty similar to what it was last week and the week before. And, you know, we're in the season of Lent. We have some changes here and there. But in essence, the liturgy is the same. Why? So that we learn it by heart. It gets into our heart because in the liturgy we have the promises of God. We have the goodness of God. We have the mercy of God. We have an opportunity to get right with God through repentance, but then he extends his forgiveness. And then during Holy Communion, we receive the body and blood of Christ as a gift. But we do this again and again and again and again so that we understand and that we know, not at an intellectual level merely, but also at a heart level, who God is, and God is for us. And who can be against us if God is for us? By doing things again and again, over and over, this is how we're able to press on, because we have that confidence that God gives us through the power of His Spirit and the power of His Word. And and His Word speaks to us in the liturgy and in Scripture and in prayer, to remind us of who he is. And that we are his beloved, redeemed people. We're a mess, but we're saved by a great God. That's why Paul could forget what was behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus that he had a present righteousness that we all need and that is available by faith. And that faith is renewed daily in Christ. We are able to press on. Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before the time of Jesus that God was going to do a new thing. And when Jesus arrived, the kingdom of God, and here's a fancy theological word, the kingdom of God was inaugurated was brought into existence by Christ. And salvation became available to everyone. And the righteousness of God became ours through what Christ did for us on the cross. That the old way was gone and a new way had come. And that Paul gives us a picture of what that new way of life looks like. And how the the past that had a hold on him And his relationship with God was now going to be replaced and was replaced by what Christ had done for him. 
that he had a righteousness from God by faith. And then he could press on with the life that God had given him. And we can press on with the life that God has given us. To press on with our time of prayer. To press on with our worship time on Sundays and in other times as well. To press on with those activities and things that give us joy and confidence and hope. And knowledge that Christ is with us. That we can renew our faith in Christ every day as we press on. And a, a day has many, many challenges. So we don't have to be concerned too much about tomorrow. Be concerned with today. And how we can live a life of pressing on. And knowing that Christ is with us. As we press on. As we press on as a church family. As we press on knowing that in, in this crazy, mixed-up world that seems like a mess every time you turn on the TV or look at the Internet, that God's given us a mission to press on with Him, to trust Him, to look to Him, to place our faith in Him. And as we do so, we know that He is with us. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and of our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, and according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with a spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy, we beseech thee also so to lead the nations of the world into the way of righteousness, and so to direct and dispose the hearts of all our leaders, especially Joe Biden, our president, and Michelle Lujan Grisham, our governor, that thy people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may truly and impartially administer justice, upholding integrity and truth to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Lord, in thy mercy. 
give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Foley, our Archbishop, Stephen, our Bishop, Pete, our Priest, and Bill, our Deacon, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments, and to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy. Prosper, we pray thee, all those who proclaim the gospel of thy kingdom among the nations, and strengthen us to fulfill thy great commission, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey all thou hast commanded. Lord, in thy mercy. We give thanks for our missionaries, especially LifeQuest USA, bringing Christ's message of future and a hope to young people in New Mexico prisons. Meredith Omland, a missionary in Mexico with SAMS, the Society of Anglican Missionaries and Senders, and Young Life Albuquerque, a mission devoted to introducing adolescents to Jesus Christ and helping them grow in their faith. Guide them, O Lord, and give them boldness to serve you. Lord, in thy mercy. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Hope, Kelly, Malcolm, Paula, Bill, Bev, John, Mike, D, Everett, Olaya, Lena, and others we now name before you. Lord, in thy mercy. We remember before thee, O Lord, all thy servants who have departed this life in thy faith and fear, that thy will for them may be fulfilled, and we beseech thee to grant us grace, so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. O oh God, our heavenly Father, by your Son, Jesus Christ, you have promised to those who seek your kingdom, kingdom and its righteousness, all things necessary to sustain their life. Send us, we pray, in this time of need, such moderate rain and showers that we may receive the fruits of the earth to our comfort and to your honor. Lord, in thy mercy. Grant these our prayers, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling as able. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, 
we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and weaknesses that we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us, we do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins, to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, good morning. Please be seated. Number of announcements starting on page 17 for you to look at and to read through. Just a reminder, a week from today is what day? Palm, Palm Sunday. I know. And uh, yeah, what's this? It's, there's Palm Sunday, and then we have special services during uh, Holy Week. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, both of those service times are at 6.30. And I, I just as a r reminder of how we distribute communion. We've got three options. We have uh, communion set up on the lower altar here. And then on this side of the nave, we'll have an opportunity for intinction. And on this side, if you would like to, to drink from the chalice directly uh, on this side as you receive communion this morning. I was uh, at a clergy conference in El Paso at St. Clement Church. Uh, Friday and Saturday, came home last night, and uh, it was excellent to see a uh, the, uh, the number of folks from uh, all over the diocese, stateside, and uh, for our friends in, in Mexico, uh, we had a Zoom link up uh, with them, and so that was, that was a, a good time of uh, teaching and fellowship, and it's good to be home. Lastly, we have a guest with us all the way from Texas, Deacon John. Welcome. Come on, stand up. Good to have you here this morning. You're looking very deacon-like, I must say. Yes. <laughs> and so, the, are you able to stick around after for coffee? Yeah. So, if you'd like to visit with uh, Deacon John, uh, and for for new, newer people, Deacon John was, you know, he was Christ the King for for years and years and years and years, and, and years. And, and yeah, I know exactly. He was here a long time. So it's great to have you here this morning. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
all things come of thee, O Lord. And of thy nose have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right to serve you. It is very meet, right, and are bound in duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace, which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the All glory be to thee, Almighty God, O Heavenly Father, for that thou thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and an institute and his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and of thine almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For in the night in which he is betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave thanks, he brake it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of the dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion, precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same, and looking for his coming again in power and great glory. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept us our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy son Jesus Christ and through faith in his blood, we in all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father, Almighty world without end. And now, as the Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
gifts of God for you, the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost us safe to feed us, who have duly received these holy mysteries, with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost to share us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you, and remain with you always. Amen. The recessional hymn is, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Thanks be to God. God.